right, if I may call it to order, uh, and I'm going to briefly introduce the members of the panel. Thank you. Uh, so this panel, it's ambitious to try to do three panels before lunch, so I'm trying to keep us on schedule. Uh, so this is our panel on international arbitration. It will be moderated by NYU law professor Franco Ferrari, and I will do a commercial for his center briefly. Uh, he and Linda Silberman both uh, are affiliated with the Center for Transnational Litigation, Arbitration, and Commercial Law here at NYU. Also an adjunct professor of law here at NYU, John Fellis. Thank you for being with us. And Andreas Frischknecht <coughs> at Chaffetz, uh, Lindsay. So welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Frank. Thank you very much, Beverly. And let's be truthful. Andreas' fame to claim is that he also is a graduate from NYU. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to be back. So this is fascinating. We will be talking about international arbitration from a US law perspective, and it is fascinating for the ones among us who are trained in foreign law. I say that because this is a very nice title for what basically will be a seminar on US exceptionalism. Years ago, we would probably all talk about French exceptionalism in international arbitration. And I think we're still allowed to talk about that. But now, as my colleagues will show, there are certain issues that are peculiar to US arbitration law when it comes to international commercial arbitration. Um, John Fellows has actually uh, written a paper outlining all of the issues, but I confined him to one issue only. For, um, he will speak about Article 1782. Then Professor Silverman will talk about other US peculiar issues from delegation, um, of course, two really bad forum non-convenience in recognition stage under the New York Convention really means this by itself should make you run out of the room. <laughs> and then, of course, we have comments to all of these issues by Andreas. John, I give you the floor for 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I trust the statute, Section 1782 of Title 28 of the US Code is familiar to most of you. I see some of my students here. We're going to get to it next class, OK? <laughs> so, so don't worry that it's not yet familiar. Although if you've done the reading already, maybe it is. Um, its title is a bit of a mouthful, Assistance to Foreign and International Tribunals and to Litigants Before Such Tribunals. But as its name suggests, it permits US courts to provide assistance in obtaining evidence for use in a proceeding before a foreign or international tribunal. Despite its long name, it is a short statute. In its current version, which was enacted in 1964, its core elements are set forth in its first two sentences. The district court of the district in which a person resides or is found may order him to give his, forgive the sexist language, to give his testimonial statement or to produce a document or other thing for use in a proceeding in a foreign or international tribunal. I pause on those words. It has been settled a long time that a court in another country is a foreign or international tribunal for the purposes of 1782. 1782 goes on. The order may be made pursuant to a letter rogatory issued or request made by a foreign or international tribunal or upon the application of any interested person. It is further settled that a party to a foreign lawsuit is an interested person for the, for the purposes of section 1782. What this means is if you have a lawsuit in France, that lawsuit is a proceeding before a foreign international tribunal for the purposes of 1782, and a party to that lawsuit, one of the litigants in that lawsuit, is entitled to apply directly to a US court to obtain evidence located in 
located in the United States, although there's a footnote to that, but let's put it aside for now, located in the United States for use in the French lawsuit. Uh, and under US law, there is no need for the litigant, the party in the French litigation, to ask, uh, to ask permission of the French court first. That person can come directly to a US court. The question is, does a foreign, excuse me, does a proceeding in a foreign or international tribunal include an international arbitration proceeding? So instead of a, if instead of a lawsuit in France, you had an ICC of international arbitration proceeding in Paris, can a party to that arbitration proceeding do the same thing, apply directly to a US court to take evidence uh, for the purposes of that international arbitration proceeding. This year, just a few months ago, we finally got an answer to that question from the US Supreme Court. But it's been a long journey. Uh, the, the, 1782 was, has been used in international arbitration proceedings since the 90s. Our applications have been made to obtain evidence for the purposes of international arbitration proceedings since about the, the 90s. And first, it seemed you could, then it seemed you couldn't, and then a decision of the Supreme Court suggested in dicta that you could, then there was a circuit split, and finally, just a few months ago, a unanimous Supreme Court held, you can't. You can't in a private arbitration proceeding, such, that, such as one under the auspices of the ICC or the ICDR or the LCIA. And the Supreme Court also held that you couldn't, you can't in an investment proceeding arbitration under the UNCTRAL rules, but the Supreme Court left, uh, left it a little bit uncertain as to whether you may be able to use it in other contexts perhaps an arbit international arbitration proceeding under the ICSID rules under an investment treaty arbitration. Just two weeks ago, the Eastern District of New York dashed any hopes <laughs> anyone might have that you could do that. So before we get to this decision of the US Supreme Court, I just wanna give you a tour of some of the highlights of the journey to get us there. As I mentioned earlier, the current version of 1782 was enacted in 1964. And the words, the words at issue, the words were focused on a proceeding in a foreign or international tribunal were added at that time. And a principal draftsman of those changes was Professor, the late Professor Hans Smith, uh, George Berman's former colleague at Columbia Law School. Section 1782 lay dormant for many years after its enactment. But in the early 80s, parties to foreign lawsuits began to apply to US courts to take evidence in the US for use in the foreign lawsuit, be it France, Spain, England, China, wherever. And 1782 became a veritable cottage industry with US lawyers writing articles and giving talks about it to lawyers from other countries in the hopes that they could persuade them to enjoy the dubious pleasures of US discovery. <laughs> there were, you might say, waves or even tsunamis of 1782 applications at that time, but not red ones. Then in the 1980s, <laughs> sorry, took a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You meant to call. <laughs> um, in the 1980s, someone had the bright idea of using 1782 in international arbitration proceedings. Some district courts granted them, some didn't, and some said we would grant them if they were blessed by the arbitral tribunal. But in 1999, in the, in the case of NBC versus Bear Stearns, the Second Circuit said, uh-uh, you can't use 1782 to obtain evidence for private arbitration proceedings. Why not? Well, based on an examination of the legislative history, the Second Circuit said that the words foreign or international tribunal refer to a governmental tribunal, not a private tribunal. And an ICC arbitration is a private proceeding, not a governmental one. Another argument that the Second Circuit offered in support of its reading 
rested on a comparison between 1782 and section seven of the Federal Arbitration Act of the, of the FAA. It said to read 1782 to allow the taking of evidence for use in a foreign arbitration would constitute an anomaly, would give rise to an anomaly. Why? Because section seven, which applies to evidence taking for arbitrations in the United States, gives courts less, less authority to allow for the taking of evidence, then it would then as compared to an international arbitration proceedings, if we were to allow 1782 to be used. Why is that? Well, it get, here's one example. As I mentioned, under 1782, a party to a foreign arbitration and arbitration in France can apply directly to a US court. Doesn't have to ask the arbitrators first, doesn't have to do anything. It has the right to apply directly to a US court. Under section seven of the FAA, courts can assist with the taking of evidence for arbitrations in the US. But the only thing they can do is enforce an arbitral summons. In other words, the arbitrators in, in effect have had to have asked for the evidence. Not whereas under 1782, the parties alone could seek the evidence. And the court, the second circuit said that such an inconsistency would be devoid of principle. Now, I just want to note in passing, but Professor Hans Smith submitted an expert affidavit to the effect that in his view, the Tone Tribunal included an arbitral tribunal. And the Second Circuit basically said, we attach no weight to that. Now, after the Second Circuit decision in 1999, the Fifth Circuit agreed. We agreed with the Second Circuit. So for all intents and purposes, we all thought, you know, I was practicing at this time. This, I managed to see this whole thing straight through um, from beginning to end. And we all thought effectively, okay, you can't use 1782 from, for international arbitration proceedings. That was the state of the law for the next five years. Then in 2004, a case reached the US Supreme Court. It wasn't, uh, it was a 1782 case, the first time a 1782 case reached the US Supreme Court. Uh, it didn't involve international arbitration. It involved an application to take evidence in connection with an investigation by the, it's a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to look at my notes, Directorate General for Competition of the Commission of the European Communities. And, but in the course of deciding that the Directorate General was a tribunal for the purposes of 1782, Ruth Gader Ginsburg quoted an article by Professor Hans Smith, which said that in his view, the term tribunal in 1782 included investigating magistrates, administrative and arbitral tribunals and quasi judicial agencies. Okay, I need to speed up. It didn't take long. <laughs> it didn't take long for the lawyers to, to seize on that, uh, on that language. And two things happened after that. Uh, some courts began to rely on that language to grant uh, 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 1782 applications for the taking of evidence for private arbitral tribunals in other countries. And courts unanimously allowed the taking of evidence for investment treaty arbitrations in other countries. Why? On the grounds that an arbitral tribunal constituted uh, pursuant to an investment treaty uh, uh, was governmental and that that was allowed. Um, and by 2020, by a couple of years ago, we began to clearly observe that curious phenomenon that occasionally occurs in US jurisprudence, the circuit split. And what happened was the second, fifth and seventh circuits held that you couldn't use 1782 for private international arbitration and the fourth and the sixth circuit said you could. Uh, a case almost reached the, actually did reach the Supreme Court last year called Servotronics, uh, in which um, 
uh, it was fully briefed, uh, including amicus briefs um, by surprise, surprise, <laughs> Professor Bowman. <laughs> and, uh, but before there was a decision, uh, it, uh, the, the case was settled. But then the case reached the Supreme Court in, in not one, but two cases. At the same time, we got a decision at the same time. ZF Automotive, uh, which was a private tribunal, seated in Munich under the DIS rules, the German Institution of Arbitration rules, and an investment treaty arbitration under the UNCITRAL rules. In that case was Alex Partners. Uh, and the Supreme Court said, you can't use 1782 for either. Now, given all the Sturm und Drang that had been generated by 1782 mm -hmm. over the last 30 years, the reasoning was surprisingly thin. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, it, we all hear that the Supreme Court, you know, you now have to make textual arguments. Well, this was Justice um, Amy Coney Barrett's first argument or first reason for reaching that decision was a textual one. She said, I accept the term tribunal standing alone may include a private arbitral tribunal. But she said, when modified by the word foreign or international, it is best understood as a governmental tribunal. She gave as an example the word foreign leader. Uh, as when you, the word foreign, I mean, this is a literal quote. The word foreign takes on a more governmental meaning when modifying a word with potential governmental or for sovereign connotations. That is why foreign suggests something different in the phrase foreign leader than it does in foreign film. You know, as, as, as Justice Rosenthal told us this morning, context matters. Like suppose next year NYU hired a president from another country. And if I were talking to her with Linda or, or Franco and I, I referred to the foreign president, it would be intelligible and rational in the context to know that I am not talking about a governmental official. And if I went to see a foreign film made by and funded by the Chinese government about President Xi, it would be fair to call that foreign film a governmental one. The best that can be said about the text is it's inconclusive. Justice Comey's uh, Barrett's second argument was about the purpose of uh, 1782. She said the purpose was to, uh, to encourage other countries to give us reciprocal, reciprocal assistance. It is difficult to see how enlisting district courts to help private bodies would serve <laughs> that end. I don't think it's that difficult at all. There's nothing anomalous in saying US courts should provide assistance, if US courts were to provide assistance to foreign arbitral tribunals seated in other countries, that might encourage other countries to permit their courts to do the same in return. In fact, unrelatedly, the English court recently, English High Court recently interpreted its own evidence gathering statute to allow for the taking of evidence for use in an international arbitration proceeding here in New York. Finally, um, Justice Barrett relied on the rationale offered by the Second Circuit, the, 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 the inconsistency in reading 1782 and to allow broader discovery than Section 7. And applying all those principles to the case, she held that um, it, it, it neither applied to the private arbitration in Munich nor to the investment treaty arbitration um, uh, under the Russia-Lithuania bit. One thing she said, because I, I think she is, you know, and I know there's a lot of disagreement on this. Um, I happen to agree with the court's ruling on investment treaty arbitrations. And this was her reasoning, and I think it's right. Um, an investment treaty arbitration is effectively modeled on a private contract. A treaty is a standing offer. The investor accepts it when it uh, uh, commences an arbitration. It's like a private contract. And that's actually, uh, was her reasoning. In a private arbitration, the panel derives its authority from the party's consent to arbitrate. The ad hoc panel, in this case, derives its authority in essentially the same way. Uh, Russia and Lithuania each agreed in the treaty to submit to ad hoc arbitration. If an investor chose it, the fund took Lithuania, Lithuania up on that offer by initiating an arbitration. As I said two weeks ago in the uh, Alpine case, uh, Judge uh, Robert Levy, who I understand is an adjunct professor here, um, uh, magistrate judge uh, in the Eastern District, held that this, 
applying Alex held that it did not, that an ICSID tribunal, uh, you couldn't get, uh, you rely on 1782 to take evidence for the, an, an ICSID tribunal. The Alex partners case involved uh, an answer trial tribunal. Let me stop there because I know I've gone over. You were very kind, Professor Ferrari. <laughs> Thank you very much. If the non-native speaking persons among us have learned anything, is that arbitrability does not mean arbitrability <laughs> and a tribunal is not a tribunal. <laughs> so when I first read 1782 many years ago, when I first came here, of course, to me, it was obvious what a tribunal would mean, but I'm wrong. <laughs> so um, at this point, Linda, you have 15 minutes as well for your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take up three specific issues relating to the recognition and enforcement of foreign convention awards that I think are good examples of US exceptionalism in international arbitration. First is the requirement of a jurisdictional nexus to bring a proceeding for recognition and enforcement. Second, the role of forum nonconvenience um, in recognition and enforcement actions and how the US courts respond to a set aside at the seat of the arbitration. And just a brief word about terminology um, in discussing recognition and enforcement uh, of arbitral awards in the United States. Chapter two of the Federal Arbitration Act, which implements the New York Convention, uses the term confirm the award rather than recognize or enforce. So I'm going to use those terms interchangeably as do the courts. Um, first, the jurisdictional requirement for recognition and enforcement. As I think most of you know, the New York and the Panama Conventions identify a set of exclusive defenses that can be used to resist recognition uh, and enforcement of an arbitral award. But the absence of jurisdiction over the defendant is not one of them. Um, but Article 3 of the New York Convention provides that each contracting state shall recognize arbitral awards as binding and enforce them in accordance with the rules of procedure where the award is relied upon. And the Panama Convention has uh, something similar with somewhat different language. Now, a few countries, including the United States, do require a jurisdictional nexus in order to recognize or enforce uh, a foreign arbitral award, although many countries, including Canada, do not. And the requirement of having such a nexus did not until recently pose any significant problem for the United States because either property of the debtor or personal jurisdiction over the debtor would have sufficed. And of course, in most instances, an award creditor wants enforcement in a forum where the defendant has assets and attachment of those assets is the basis of jurisdiction in that context. But when the award debtor does not presently have assets in the United States, but where they are likely to come in later, the award creditor may want recognition of that award now, particularly because this is another exception. Um, in the US, there's a three year statute of limitation in which to bring the recognition and enforcement proceeding. And in a case where there are no assets in the territory, personal jurisdiction is going to be required. There are some other reasons that personal jurisdiction might be attractive, even if there are assets. But until recently, personal jurisdiction did not seem to be a significant hurdle. So you could use domicile or residency, and it had been possible, and I stress had been, to obtain jurisdiction over a foreign award debtor who had systematic and continuous activities in the United States. And that basis of jurisdiction was particularly helpful in obtaining recognition of an award where a foreign party didn't have assets presently available. There was a Supreme Court decision in 2014, the Daimler versus Bauman case, which prevented this type of jurisdiction from being exercised in a traditional plenary action. Um, and courts in the United States um, now started to rely on Daimler um, as a basis for limiting jurisdiction over a foreign award debtor and the Samara case in the Second Circuit did just that. Now, the Daimler rule made good sense in a plenary uh, action, um, which is you know, the usual kind of litigation. And it's an attempt to prevent forum shopping when the case has only tangentially a relationship 
the form has only a ten tangential relationship to the parties or the transaction, but a proceeding to recognize and enforce an arbitral award is quite different. It's summary in nature. It has limited defenses. And of course, the conventions are designed to ensure the portability of arbitral awards. Um, unfortunately, lower courts um, appear to have embraced an error. They are going to require that the defendant be at home, meaning it has its place of incorporation or principal place of business in that forum. Um, but the Supreme Court has not addressed the issue. Um, I wrote an extensive article about why these requirements, why the Daimler requirement had no relevance in um, recognition and enforcement. Um, and you know, maybe the Supreme Court will eventually see the issue my way, um, even if they uh, have not been so receptive to George. Um, I, I, I noted earlier that a, an independent jurisdictional nexus doesn't seem to be required in a number of countries. So one reason may be that there's a sense that parties who agree to arbitrate under the one of the conventions may have, in fact, consented to recognition and enforcement in another convention country. However, lower courts in the United States seem to have rejected that view. Although I just mentioned this now, a domestic jurisdiction case argued this week, the Mallory case in the Supreme Court on a very different issue, but has focused on the role of consent as an independent basis of jurisdiction. So something may flow from that, we'll have to see. Um, and in that sense, it's interesting to know that with respect to a recognition proceeding brought against a foreign state or instrumentality, a specific provision in the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act 1605A6 establishes both an exception to immunity and a jurisdictional nexus to the United States. And that provision says that an action against a foreign state or instrumentality is proper to confirm an award made pursuant to an agreement to arbitrate when the award is governed by a treaty in force in the United States that calls for recognition and enforcement. And although the due process clause does operate as a limit on what, what is in effect statutory, uh, basis of jurisdiction. Um, 1605A6 arguably rests on a theory of applied consent and it's a formal assertion of jurisdiction. And so I just point out that um, recognition of an arbitral award jurisdiction in that case may be easier to establish against a foreign state than against a private defendant to the fact that you can use sort of implied consent. Okay, let me move on to the role of forum nonconvenience. Um, this one may be even more exceptional than any of the others. As I said, jurisdiction is something that other countries uh, use. And I just should mention, George has a, a compendium of uh, recognition and enforcement practice uh, across countries. Uh, and it gives uh, an overview of many of the issues we're talking about. Um, forum nonconvenience, of course, used in many common law countries. It's used in a plenary action where a court has discretion to um, dismiss uh, a case if it thinks there's an adequate alternative forum that's more appropriate. Um, but extending that doctrine to recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral wars is much more controversial, and other common law countries do not use it in this context. Um, now, courts have justified the use as a rule of procedure under Article 3 of the Convention. And you might not think that forum nonconvenience is the type of procedure that the conventions have in mind. But the Supreme Court, in one of its other rulings, has referred to forum nonconvenience as a rule of procedure. And indeed, with respect to other conventions, including the Montreal Convention, um, courts in the United States have understood it as a procedural doctrine uh, that can be used, and therefore uh, holding forum nonconvenience intact. The Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in the Figueredo case held that forum nonconvenience was appropriate. Uh, in a court in the United States, and they dismissed an action against a foreign state where there were other assets, although more limited than the ones in the United States, but there were assets available in Peru. On the other hand, moving again to 
something of a circuit split. The Court of Appeals of the DC Circuit in the government of Belize versus BC Holdings case said that the doctrine of foreign non-convenience does not apply um, at least when brought against a foreign state. Now the rationale of that case along with an earlier one is that the foreign defendants assets in the United States can only be attached in the United States. So there's no adequate alternative forum. Um, and thus the requirements of forum non can't be satisfied. I didn't really say you can't use forum non. I just said you can't satisfy its uh, requirements. And the DC circuit adhered to that view in its most recent ruling in the Tatnaf versus Ukraine case just in December of last year. And despite the split among the circuits, the Supreme Court just denied cert on that point. So although I agree that forum non-convenience is inappropriate um, in this situation, I'm certainly not persuaded by the DC circuit's um, explanation. I'm not quite sure why if there are other assets, that's not good enough. Um, now the new restatement um, of international commercial and investor state arbitration takes the position that uh, a foreign convention award is not subject to foreign non-convenience. And they say, and on this point, I disagree with George, uh, they say it's incompatible with the convention obligation of a contracting state. Um, I'm not at all sure that the convention prohibits it. I think a more persuasive argument is that it's an inappropriate doctrine in the context of recognition and enforcement. Um, the summary procedures undercut any need for the traditional reasons that you use uh, forum not convenience. So if I have just a few minutes left, minutes. Um, let, me, <laughs> let me just say a word about enforcement of awards set aside uh, at the seat. The question about how to treat uh, an arbitral award that's been annulled uh, elsewhere is faced by many countries. Um, and that comes from uh, Article 5.1e that says recognition and enforcement may be refused if the award has not yet become binding or has been set aside or suspended by a competent authority of the country in which or under the law of which that award was made. Um, as underscored by the permissive language, um, there's no obligation one way or the other. Uh, and so it is really left to national law. A number of courts say, well, once it's set aside, there's nothing to recognize or enforce. The seat has set it aside. And basically the notion is you <clears throat> ceded authority to that place and you should, and you acquiesce, acquiesce in what they do. And a number of civil countries uh, have adopted that approach. A few countries, most notably France, um, and this is really one of the French exceptionalisms that Professor Ferrari mentioned uh, a, a minute ago, um, they view international arbitration as its own regime and uh, a transnational order. And so um, an award and now with the place of arbitration is really irrelevant what they do. We'll use our own law, French law. It doesn't mean we'll necessarily enforce the award, but we'll look to the grounds under uh, French law. Now, most courts in the United States, I think could be said, appeared to respect a set-aside judgment, although the standard, I think, was not very clear. An early Second Circuit said, well, um, to ignore a set-aside, we need adequate reasons. And then the DC Circuit said, well, only extraordinary circumstances will justify ignoring the set aside and enforcing the award. In 2016, the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit became the first US federal appellate court to confirm a foreign convention award that had been set aside at the seat. Um, the Court of Appeals in the Commissa versus Pemex case recognized an award in favor of Commissa, which was a Mexican subsidiary of but a US corporation against the Mexican state owned petroleum company, Pemex, and they recognized that even though it had been set aside by a court at the Mexican sea. What the Second Circuit said is we're going to be guided by comity, and they use the standards that we look at for any kind of um, foreign judgment. And because it found the set aside was based on some retroactive application of the law as they saw it, and also the plaintiff had no remedy left, they refused to honor the set aside as a matter of public policy, which is, of course, 
um, a traditional defense in recognition and enforcement of judgments. Now, two subsequent cases in the Second Circuit sensibly applied this same judgment framework. But I think both cases, I mean, I don't think both cases did give effect to the set aside and refused to enforce the award. But I think it's raised questions about how you use um, the judgments approach, which I have to say, I wrote an article urging that you use the judgments approach. Now I look at these cases and I know, well, maybe it's a bit more complicated uh, <laughs> than I thought. I didn't like the standard that my um, mentor and former colleague, the late Andreas Lowenfeld said, he said you should um, not recognize the set aside when it's fishy. And <laughs> that was sort of Andy, he loved fishy and he loved unreasonableness. I like rules. And so I thought in that sense, I take a play from the civil law world. Um, and I thought the judgments criteria would work and maybe uh, it will. Um, in Tai Lao, the court uh, said, well, the grounds there were different. And so they also have a second crack. So uh, it's different than Pemex. And then the most recent case um, in which uh, Andreas was a, a counsel um, may be a little more troubling because it was alleged there that the Nigerian court uh, at the seat had set aside the award against a Nigerian state entity. And it was alleged that the unfairness in the Nigerian system always favored a state entity. So they were always going to set aside an award when the beneficiary would be the state entity. However, the US court um, looked back at the set aside and they, they started to inquire. And they said that um, we think the Nigerian court relied on Nigerian law and they rationalized, rationally analyzed the issue. And it also found that there were other evidence of Nigerian decisions against various Nigerian state entities um, that ruled against Nigerian <laughs> entities. I don't know what evidence was submitted in that case, but I think the ESO case does indicate that there's um, a good framework um, to try to think about set-asides um, and it will allow you perhaps to make a further inquiry um, that maybe is used in the more traditional judgments. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought, but let's be clear, no forum non-convenience in recognition under the New York match, whatever colleagues court say, forget that. <laughs> um, the he has a view. <laughs> I never have views. Um, so as far as for non-convenience in the Montreal Convention, of course, let's be truthful. The French Supreme Court has criticized exactly that approach um, because even under the Montreal Convention, probably forum non-convenience should not be used. And the better courts understood this when the Warsaw Convention was the applicable convention. So a lot can be said, and I'm normally not necessarily in favor of French exceptionalism. Here I have to actually defend French exceptionalism. Why? Because the French apply their own recognition law on the base of Article 7. So unfortunately or not, Article 7, of course, of the New York Convention allows domestic rules on recognition and enforcement to come into play. Now, US law cannot be justified on the basis of Article 7, in my opinion, as it targets actually the annulment judgment rather than the decision. Andy, you have also 15 minutes, and I know you have views on all of these things. Thank you, Professor uh, Ferrari. I'm going to take up the challenge of being the last speaker before lunch by um, touching on three issues or topics that I think others have covered today already, but just hopefully not retreading over existing ground, hopefully adding a, a couple of additional points. Uh, the first issue is judicial review of arbitral jurisdiction, which is really closely related or a subset of this delegation issue that Professor Berman's panel uh, spoke about earlier today. Um, and I'm going to touch on a couple of points that I think weren't specifically made. The first is that the New York Convention in Article 5.1c specifically and explicitly contemplates that at the enforcement stage uh, where there is a jurisdictional defect, the award may not be enforced. It says, and I'll just read it briefly, recognition and enforcement of the award may be refused where the award deals with a difference not contemplated by or not falling within 
the terms of a submission to arbitration, or it contains decisions on matters beyond the scope of the submission to arbitration. But for the reasons we heard earlier, in the United States at least, under uh, the existing uh, case law in, in virtually every circuit, a party can expect to receive, if any, only highly deferential review, which in practice is virtually no review at all, um, where the arbitration pr proceeded uh, pursuant to one of the standard institutional rules. So the interesting thing about this, though, is that a couple of months ago, um, I co-authored an article uh, that uh, was published in the ICC Bulletin with a visiting German lawyer who was with our firm for a few months. And I thought I'd take the opportunity of having this lawyer with us to see what the situation is in Germany. Now, on paper, the German system is the exact opposite of the United States. Um, the court must, in Germany, in all cases, have the final say on matters of arbitral jurisdiction. Review is always de novo. The parties can't waive it, not permitted to waive it. And a party can seek preventive judicial, a preventive judicial determination of arbitral jurisdiction before the tribunal has even been constituted. So the exact opposite of what we have here as, as, a, as a practical matter. But... Oh, I should say that and, and, and German courts give no deference to the arbitral tribunal's determination on jurisdiction. But the interesting thing is that this very different rule appears to have little uh, outcome, little, little impact on practical outcomes. So my co-author looked at all the reported German decisions going back to the 1970s, uh, in which the resisting party asserted an Article 5.1c defense under the convention. Now, once again, this also was mentioned earlier today, the sample size is relatively small. There were 26 reported cases, but none of those 26 cases and none of them did the court refuse or did the court uh, decline to enforce the award for lack of jurisdiction. And even though the sample size is small, if a court had refused, because courts in Germany have discretion as to which de decisions they wanna publish, if a court had refused enforcement, that would have been an interesting decision and we think likely would have been published. So the fact that of the 26 cases, none refused to enforce shows that even if, even if de novo review is permitted, courts are reluctant to effectively um, find no jurisdiction. And in Germany, it, it, it's done in such a way that courts broadly interpret the arbitration clause. So they always find that somehow the claim falls within the clause, even though they're not deferring to the arbitral tribunal. I'm gonna move on briefly to personal jurisdiction, which Professor Silberman talked about a moment ago. Um, I will say though that there, I'll make a bit of a play devil's advocate for why a personal jurisdiction um, requirement in the US context might actually make sense. And that is because a party, uh, an award creditor, very well may have an incentive to come to the United States, even if there's no real prospect of future assets, because once an award has been recognized and reduced to judgment, that creditor gets the same rights as any other judgment creditor. So full asset discovery for worldwide assets uh, and, 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 other, and other tools that can be very onerous for the debtor. And, and, and by way of example, um, Professor Silverman mentioned the Sonera case where the Second Circuit uh, basically adopted the Supreme Court's Daimler <clears throat> approach to personal jurisdiction in the award enforcement context. And we happen to have been counsel in that case in the district court where the district court under the old continuous and systematic contacts standard found that the debtor was subject to general jurisdiction in New York. Um, and respectfully, I, I disagree that there were systematic and continuous contacts because in fact, one of the main grounds on which the contacts were found were that this company had a subsidiary that had an office in New York based on a website. It turned out the website was outdated. There was no office in New York. In reality, this debtor had no connection whatsoever with the United States, but nevertheless, um, one tool, for example, that, that, a, that a creditor has in New York is a so-called restraining notice, where you can issue a restraining notice as counsel to your counterparty and basically you know, 
compel them to restrain, to, to, to not deal in their assets. This was a billion dollar award. So opposing counsel had a restraining notice where the, the, the foreign client couldn't deal in up to a billion dollars of their assets. They refused to comply. There were sanctions. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big, big um, litigation. Eventually, the Second Circuit found there was no jurisdiction. But that just sort of illustrates the specific U.S. procedural context might make a personal jurisdiction requirement somewhat sensible. And, and finally, the, uh, the final topic I'll just touch on is the set-aside, which um, Professor Silverman also spoke about. Um, and as, as she mentioned, we were, we were counsel in the uh, scenario, in the um, SO case as well. Um, now it's interesting, the sample size is once again very small. Um, from what we've been able to glean, there's something like eight federal cases in which courts have considered um, whether to enforce an arbitral award that was set aside at the seat. And in two of them, one was the 2016 uh, Second Circuit decision that Professor Silverman mentioned in the Pemex case. The other one is a DC district court case from the 90s. In two of them, did the court actually um, refused to honor the set aside, or in fact, confirmed, enforced the award that had been set aside at the seat. In six cases, the court um, did not enforce the award. In other words, recognized the set aside decision. So there's small sample size, but it's, it's a pretty high threshold to get a US federal court to recognize an arbitral award that has been set aside at the seat. Um, the other thing I would just mention is, something that Professor Silverman actually touched on, it seems to me that a, what, what the Second Circuit is saying in the, in the new case, in effect, is that the party um, resisting recognition of the set aside, in other words, the award creditor that wants the award to be enforced in the United States, even though it's been set aside at the seat, really has to show some kind of concrete procedural irregularity, something really serious that went wrong in that case, which was the case in Pemex. Um, the, and then you, I think that that party will have a shot at, at winning. But in, in the SO case, as Professor Silverman explained, really there was a very sort of inferential argument. Well, it's, this is a Nigerian state-owned debtor, and this is a big case, and they never lose big cases. It's never happened. You know, the whole. In effect, our argument was you're you're putting the entire Nigerian judicial system on trial here, and that's really not appropriate. And I think the Second Circuit agreed with that. Thank you very much. So, before opening the floor to the audience. Um, I myself have a question, and I see that Professor Silberman has a comment to make. You want to go yes, first? Yes, I just wanted to. I just wanted to respond to something so that I'm not misunderstood about the role of jurisdiction. I feel very strong that there absolutely has to be a jurisdictional nexus to bring a recognition and enforcement action, just for all the reasons that Andy uh, referenced. I mean, you just don't want someone coming in and bringing um, an action with no connection whatsoever. Um, however, where I do disagree is that the court take the Daimler standard addressed to a very different kind of plenary action. So in the article that I wrote, I suggested both with respect to recognition of awards and judgments that that old systematic and continuous activities that if the foreign defendant, the foreign uh, award debtor, whether it's a judgment um, or an arbitral award is doing systematic and continuous activities, that is good enough. Um, and it's good enough because the Daimler rule was designed for a very different kind of proceeding, a plenary, um, a, a plenary action where you see that kind of forum shopping. We agree that you can forum shop um, for a place to recognize and enforce the award, so long as the foreign award debtor or uh, judgment debtor has a connection whether it be residency, domicile, but with respect to foreign parties, a systematic and continuous presence. Now, when she says, we agree, it's the two colleagues, okay? <laughs> so, I do not agree. <laughs> this being said, I have a question on whether really the 1782 uh, means of getting um, evidence is dead. So what if there's an arbitration clause 
And what if the arbitration clause refers to an arbitration with a seat in a country where only a positive competence competence principle applies? Why do I say that? I'm one of the parties and I start state court proceedings in that country in order to get, of course, then I can use 1782 clearly. Opposing party will say, no, Professor Farai, you can't be in this court. Let's go to arbitration. Then my question is, I have actually what I wanted because I've initiated, I haven't even only a prospective claim. I've initiated court proceedings. <laughs> Clearly opposing party will say, no, there's an arbitration clause. And I say, okay, there's an arbitration clause. Am I then allowed to use the evidence I got? That's an ingenious theory. You know, one thing about 1782, <laughs> you don't have to have a pending claim to rely on it. And it's an important fact. In other words, you would think, and let's take the easy case of foreign litigation, you would think you would have had already to commence the foreign litigation where you're undisputedly allowed to use 1782. You don't, it's sufficient that one is in reasonable contemplation according to the Supreme Court in, in Intel. So what you're, in a sense, relying on that to some degree uh, and, and contemplating, uh, uh, either contemplating or commencing- and commence. Commence a lawsuit in another country. And, and then there's a dispute about yes. arbitrability. Now, if I were opposing you, the one thing I would argue to the US court, but this dispute should be in arbitration, your honor, uh, please, we should wait at least to let the foreign court decide the issue of arbitrability before you grant this relief. I suspect that may be a convincing mm -hmm. argument. And you have- and There's some interesting fine line distinctions that then arise in the 1782 context. If there is a straight up foreign enforcement proceeding to enforce an award in jurisdiction X, that doesn't count as a foreign proceeding. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, for example, if you have a plenary case, uh, we had a case last, last year where we got 1782 for a veil piercing lawsuit in Brazil, where the it was a plenary lawsuit, but they were trying to impose liability on a third party under a veil piercing theory for an existing arbitral award. And that was okay, we were able to do it. So, but if it's a straight up, you know, enforcement proceeding, and you're trying to get asset discovery, that doesn't work. So these are, there's some really fine line distinctions that happen in that context. So let's put it this way, litigation around 1782 is not that yet. Linda, you have- I guess I could just pose a question to John. It, can you use um, the CPLR provisions um, for discovery and aid of arbitration to get around uh, the Supreme Court decision? <laughs> that may be unfair, but I mean, that, that provision is sitting there and I never really quite understood the relationship between those provisions and... Yes, I mean, the question is going to be, you know, you tend to use those provisions when you have an arbitration seated here, yeah. right? Um, can you use them for an arbitration because elsewhere? And that I don't know. I mean, okay. you know, but the English High Court recently interpreted Section 42 right. of the English Arbitration Act, which had traditionally just been used for arbitrations seated in, in the UK to, to actually allow for the taking of evidence for use in a proceeding here in New York. So- Well, there's also an interesting kind of, the, the court talks about the asymmetry yes. of, of, of section seven and 1782. There's now arguably a different asymmetry yes. because you can use section seven uh, for an arbitration seated in the United States yes. to get information here, whereas for somebody who, who's here, but a, a witness here, but you cannot get that same witness for a foreign arbitration, but it might make those of us interested in attracting arbitration to New York may all of a sudden found another reason why arbitration in New York um, can be a benefit. Yes. I mean, I, you know, one lens through which I look at this issue is the distinction between courts of primary jurisdiction and courts of secondary jurisdiction, right? When a, a, an arbitration is seated in a particular place, that is the court of primary jurisdiction and that particular court has oversight over it. Um, whereas an, from the standpoint of the US, an arbitration seated elsewhere is a court of secondary jurisdiction. And I, 
I do think, I, I do agree with the Second Circuit's reasoning on this, and I know, George, you disagree on this, that, that it, it is, there is an anomaly in saying that when you're the court of primary ju jurisdiction, you have less authority than when you're the court of secondary jurisdiction, which would be the effect of reading 1782. Um, to allow broad, you know, to be used in private arbitration proceedings. We have five more minutes. Yes, Roger first, and then our colleague. Yes. So I'm curious about the strategic uh, workarounds of the law firm how to pursue in light of the Supreme Court's decision. Are uh, law firms going to generate actions, judicial actions, in the seat of arbitration and in a measure or a request for a subpoena of a third party or something like that and then bootstrap the you know assistance to the foreign court which is assisting the arbitration to generate 1782 actions yes <laughs> i mean i think they are going to try to think of creative ways around you know i i and this is i think to some extent what Professor Ferrari just just suggested you could commence a, a lawsuit in another country on an issue that is subject to arbitrability and and seek to get that the, the evidence that way. I, I do think it will be a compelling argument in response, however, to say, look, let's wait and see what the foreign court does um, before you you make a decision here. But I don't know, maybe people have different views. <laughs> you wanted to comment then now? No, I just uh, no. the one one of the differences, of course, is just John had mentioned the English Act. Yeah. You don't get discovery. I mean, both of the yes. cases in the United States were about yes. discovery, yes. right? And uh, 1782, um, I mean, has posed a sort of curious limit because you can't use it at all um, to get even information exactly. for the hearing. And of course, the English Act, which reaches arbitration seated elsewhere will not get you discovery it will get you information at the hearing so the one of the things i mean the the reaction to 1782 has often been about discovery but i think one thing that's sometimes overlooked is that you now have taken away the ability to even use that information in a hearing and so some of those foreign courts are uh, we'll get you that information, at least for the hearing. Please. Thank you so much. Um, my question is also about 1782, um, 1782 and ICSID. Um, so it seems to me that the, the key holding in Alex Partners was that for a tribunal to be a foreign or international tribunal within the meaning of 1782, it must be imbued with governmental authority. Fast forward to Alpine and Magistrate Judge Levy found insufficient support for the proposition that China as the home state of the Hong Kong incorporated entity Alpine and Malta had intended to imbue an exit um, tribunal with governmental authority. If we wanted to challenge this, what do you think is the best argument in support of the proposition that an exit tribunal uh, has been imbued with governmental authority, maybe by reference to the Administrative Council, the fact that they have the right to designate arbitrators, the panel, etc. Um, you know, one thing that is interesting about Ju uh, Judge Levy's decision is that he takes pains to go through the differences between the answer troll and answer troll <laughs> tribunal and an exit <laughs> tribunal, and then ignores exactly. them. <laughs> and he's not here, right? <laughs> and then and then ignores them. Um, and and I, I found that a little bit bizarre. He just he just picks up on one point, which is the argument made that um, that uh, you can in, exit awards are entitled to full faith and credit. And he says, yes, but so what? Um, but I do think that there are differences. You're absolutely right um, between between an exit tribunal and it's obviously a, a body. They're obviously permanent members uh, um, uh, of, of the exit. Um, and so that would be the argument one would make. I, I must confess, my personal view is on the other side of this. I, I tend to view uh, an exit. I mean, if you're going to not allow it for private arbitrations, for ICC arbitrations, I just don't see a material difference between a private arbitration and, 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 and a, a treaty arbitration. 
both both are at the end of the day are modeled on a private contract. The treaty is an invitation, and the investor um, uh, investor accepts the treaty by um, accepts the invitation um, by uh, an offer, an offer to arbitrate, and which is accepted upon the commencement of the arbitration. You know, the the tricky thing that I find is well, if <laughs> Because the whole point when, when 1782 was amended in 1964, the, the language taken out was court. You know, there was a reference to, I think, foreign courts or something like that, and they changed it to foreign and international tribunals. So what could that mean beyond the court once you exclude arbitral tribunals? And I've been thinking long and hard about this. Has anyone been to Ireland? I'm sure some yes. people have been to Ireland. Every time I go, there's something in the paper about a tribunal investigating something or other that's <laughs> happening. You know, the, the price of beef, um, bribes to planning commissions. There is an independent government tribunal set up. It's populated often by private lawyers, sometimes by judges. To me, that is a governmental tribunal. The, the, the participants, the people on it are paid for by the government. They're there at the behest of the government. It's not the case with arbitrators, even exit arbitrators. They're paid for by the parties. You know, they have their hearings often in hotel rooms or, or lawyers' offices or arbit private arbitration centers. I, I do think they're, they're, you know, there are things that are not caught so that are governmental. And I once you, if you take the position that, you know, an ICC arbitration uh, can't, you know, you can't use it 1782 there, then I think ICSID follows for me. It's a nice thing about NYU Law School, you have completely different and completely different views on one and the same panel, let alone one and the same law school. We completely disagree. <laughs> <laughs> a very quick question, then we have to stop. You had a question, yeah, George. I want to disappoint you. Um, um, John, I think you you didn't give Justice Barrett enough credit. She also mangled the word international. And she said international must have a governmental flavor as well. I told my students that she's done away with private international exactly. law. Yes, uh, yes. The only other thing I wanted to say is prompted by by Linda's um, by Linda's discussion, both of form non convenience and personal jurisdiction, and Article Three of the New York Convention, I th th these discussions make me more and more convinced that we should be not should not be putting issues of jurisdiction in the procedural bucket. We uh, we are we're so imbued with the substance procedure dichotomy, and we know jurisdiction is not substantive, so by default it gets put in the procedural bucket. Now, I think you'll agree with me that uh, forum non convenience, if I said article three doesn't cover jurisdictional issues, then I would have a stronger case for no forum non convenience. With respect to personal jurisdiction, the constitution gets in the way, agreed? Uh, but more generally, what do you think, Linda, about my, this my, well, my growing discomfort with, with tucking jurisdiction under procedure. Well, I mean, I think it. You, I, you didn't hear me emphasize um, sort of jurisdiction as a matter of procedure because in the the, the requirement of jurisdiction um, comes in the U.S. really from the Constitution, and I think. One could certainly argue from there, um, and and in the exceptionalism bucket, if you will, there are many courts that require a jurisdictional nexus. Even if some of them will say jurisdiction is via consent um, once you sign on to one of these conventions. So, but I think the harder issue, and I, I agree with you, I don't think forum nonconvenience is the kind of thing that they were thinking about with respect to um, that they were thinking about with respect to the notion of procedure. And I only mentioned that, you know, when somebody looks at a Supreme Court case and says it's a matter of procedure, and sometimes they use it because they want to tell you that the forum can use its own rule. Um, and, and, in, and in the state federal context, they want to explain that if it's an issue about 
procedure that by and large the forum can use its own rules. And it's in that context that the Supreme Court characterizes forum nonconvenience as a matter of procedure. Um, the worst thing that happens is now um, <clears throat> electronic research because you type in the term uh, procedure and you get cases that come out of every context whatsoever. And I think if there's one lesson that I always try to teach students, it is make sure you understand the context in which this concept is being defined and understood. Because once you change context, very different kinds of things uh, matter. And sometimes when I teach procedure, I refuse to allow the students to use the term procedure. They have to find some other word so that they can do exactly what you know, what just you one say. thing, yes, personal quickly. jurisdiction. You could say the same thing. Is that procedural? I'm sorry? Proce personal jurisdiction. Is that procedural? We're kind of saying, well, just because it's forum law, it's procedural. I'm not sure it is. Now, just to give you a solution to this, <laughs> <laughs> the other center here at NYU for transnational education, arbitration, and commercial law has done research on exactly this issue. In fact, Professor Berman has contributed with a paper on the autonomous meaning of procedure under Article 3 of the New York Convention. I urge you to read it. It's correct. Great. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for your comments and thank you to the audience.